The Fire of the Fandom was an opportunity to create not just a counter narrative to what we've been seeing from corporatized entertainment, but a way for all of us to remind one another that we all want to sit around that warm, glowing fire of our fandoms. Over the last couple of months, it has felt like not very many people are welcome around the Tolkien fandom. We're all just ists and phobes, according to the marketing plan of a large transnational corporation that bought the rights to some of Tolkien's material. What would Tolkien think of all this? Well, I think his letters tell us that pretty clearly. What I hope you take away from this is that all of us, regardless of whether we're large YouTube channel content creators or we just occasionally show up in people's live stream chats, is that all of our voices are equal. They're all valid and they all belong. We want to remind those corporations who are busy labeling us just what it means to be a fan and what it feels like to sit around that fire of this fandom. When I was a little girl, sometime in the 80s, I don't quite recall, it was the the cartoon of The Hobbit, I recall doing that, and the book The Hobbit, because my brother got it from school, and that's how I first was introduced. So I must have been about 11, 10 years old, maybe. Talk about a deep question. And, and part of the reason is, is because um, I am a practicing Roman Catholic. So when I first was, as the grown-up, introduced to the Lord of the Rings, as I was reaching a more mature form of my faith, I was like, dear God, I finally have a work that's done, a fiction work that is an accurate representation of the... Uh, the Order of Grace, as, as Tolkien calls it in his books, and the fact that he, he it so infused his own personal life, his family, his whole sense of honor, and to see that on the screen, especially when it came into the movie form, but of course I was seeing that in the books, to see it in a fictional form was just so beautiful to see the Lembus, to see the etherealness of the elves, to hear them call out to Elbereth. Those were all things that we understood in the line in the order of grace. And then of course I read his letters and it deepened it even more. Uh, it brings back the idea that stories are sacred, no matter what they are. And that's why I don't like people messing with stories. And you have to stay true to what the author originally intended. So you have something like with Tolkien, where he said it's a, it's a Catholic work and it's imbued in the story. And it's something very beautiful to me and what's it beautiful in my life. And that's why I feel so strongly about other mythologies, maybe that aren't Christian or were pre-Christian. That's also why you can't mess with them. Stories are sacred. So that is what has continued to assist me in my journey with Lord of the Rings and every time I reread it I just got done rereading the Silmarillion on my channel it just brings me deeper into that and to the beauty of mythology and the truths that mythology want to convey Faramir First of all, because he's the man I've always wanted to marry, though he's not real. <laughs> but he really struck me in The Two Towers. One, he's the only character besides Bombadil who had immunity, if you will, to the ring. Though his immunity was a little bit different than Tom Bombadil in the sense that he was such a spiritual man and such a scholarly man. That's the other thing. I'm a scholar in the fact that he was such a scholar and that he had this instinct that he knew 
the ring was so horrid, he wasn't tempted by it. And I remember thinking that was very interesting. Let me rephrase that. He was tempted by it, but he wanted nothing to do with it. And he even said, what was it? If I walked by it on the side of the road, I wouldn't pick it up if I'm quoting him correctly. Because his temptation was always couched in the healthy respect of what it would mean to him as a man. When I say a man here, I mean as a human, as opposed to someone like Gandalf, who knew what kind of a horrible human being or something he could do. It's always seemed to me that Faramir had such a healthy respect for what it would do to his soul. And so that just, the whole dialogue just really struck me. And of course, the way he wooed Eowyn, I was like, could a man please woo me like that? Thank you very much. I think it's unfair to compare the adaptations because you're talking about different mediums. Most likely, almost perfectly, the the Peter Jackson movies, though I'm very, very well aware of their limitations, I think it was the closest we've been able to see as a true adaptation for us in the modern times. The radio show was great, but again, a different medium, so you still had to use your imagination. So I, I'm not ob objecting in any way, shape, or form to an adaptation or even an adaptation that has to take some liberties the way the Peter Jackson film did, so long as it is faithful. So I'm open to all of them, though, of course, text is king. What Tolkien originally wrote will always have the biggest place in my heart. Blasphemy. <laughs> I, I, I swear, I almost see it almost on a religious sense. It's like saying my mother in the same sentence as that whore. Okay? It has nothing to do with Tolkien. And the fact that they have the nerve to say they're doing what Tolkien couldn't do, I feel like, okay, I'm very passionate here. I feel like Will Smith saying, get your wife's name out of my mouth. My, you keep Tolkien's name out of your mouth. The, the disrespect that they have, it has absolutely nothing to do with anything. Not one nor the other. As ever, this is Salty Texas Sea. I am Corey DB. Thanks so much for watching. If you like what you've seen and heard, please hit that thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed, I'd love to have you on board. That way you know and we have things like live streams, which we are going to be doing every Tuesday evening. Take care. I hope you're having a great 2022.